Bueno, esta conversación se enmarca dentro de la idea de poder ampliar también todas estas cuestiones que se plantean a partir de mis investigaciones en, en relación, que ponen en relación las imágenes con los gestos y con la historia en esa resistencia a la historicidad. De alguna manera también está eh, como centralidad el cuerpo, pero también como cuestionamiento, es decir, ¿qué es eso? ¿No? Eh, ¿a, qué, ¿A qué nos referimos? Esa idea de corporalidad eh, permeable, de corporalidad a la escucha, de dispositivo de atención, de dispositivo de relación, también nos lleva a pensar en eh, formas de reflexión eh, vinculadas a la antropología o a, a otras formas de conocimiento, pero principalmente en esta línea en relación de la antropología con la performatividad, con los estudios de coreografía y con las prácticas experimentales de la coreografía, nos parecía que Rita Natalio eh, tiene mucho que decir y tiene mucho que aportar. ¿no? Este perfil, eh, además de Rita, que es tan inusual, ¿no? alguien que puede eh, bueno, conectar como todas estas esferas que a veces resultan de, de difícil conexión. Y en conversación además con Julia Morandeira, cuyos estudios también eh, nos llevan como a zonas de, de un pensamiento que sucede como por debajo de, de los cuerpos, por debajo de los ojos, en las esferas del tiempo no reglado y de, y de temporalidades otras con las que ya está trabajando. También nos parecía que esta conversación, eh, bueno, la intención que tiene también es como ampliar todas estas nociones que hemos estado eh, hablando Pablo y yo, que han sido dos conferencias muy centradas en la cuestión de la imagen y transitar hacia la performance de Tiago a través de una recogida de, bueno, se han planteado varios ejes que ahora van a, vamos a compartir, eh, sobre todo en relación, como, como digo, a estas formas um, nuevas antropologías y también a, bueno, a, a reflexiones más vinculadas a, a la relación entre lo humano y, no, lo, y lo no humano, lo humano y lo vegetal, otras formas de existencia, las, estas ideas de, de, bueno, de una coreografía más molecular o más detenida en la que hacemos un poco de lupa o de zoom y de suspensión de las temporalidades también. Gracias, Julia. Como sabes, te quiero desde antes de nacer. <risa> y gracias, Rita, por estar aquí. Un placer. Um, hola. Uh, hola a todos. Eh, yo voy a hablar en inglés, perdón, pero yo creo que será más uh, fácil que nos entendamos. Y and, and thank you, uh, Pablo, for speaking about Portugal. I, which was, I just came from there today, so I was thinking about Saramago and Pablo Rego a lot. Uh, so maybe I... I uh, well, I met Julia today, <laughs> even uh, we have been chatting since last year, but we decided to do this talk that we should m maybe contextualize a bit my, my practice in order for us to d also to... Um, enrich a bit the, the discussion that we can have in relation to the other discussions. So I, I am a performance, a performance artist and a, and a poet, but I have been um, developing uh, a research in anthropology and I'm actually finishing uh, a PhD in anthropology in the University of Sao Paulo. I was living in Brazil in the last six, seven years. And, and this uh, PhD is also connected with art studies. So in a way, performance art and anthropology, they are intermingled in my practice, and especially in the fields of writing. And uh, the theme of my work has mainly to do with climate change and the Anthropocene. So it's a discussion around collapse and around crisis. So politics is very important in this debate. And when we talk about uh, performance and representation and identity and images, of course, I cannot uh, help myself to think about absence as a reflection on politics and, uh, and even when it's discussed at, about anthropology, it's the same. So, uh, one of my main interests is, is, is has to do with words and has to do to, with language and to the extent as language has money, as uh, Franco Berardo Bifo once said, 
uh, they have something in common because they they are nothing but they move everything. So in a way they have the same kind of code, they have a, a common code. Uh, so I've been uh, engaged with this idea that extending language can can, th that language can be extended also to uh, the so-called non-human beings. So language is not a privilege of humanity, as we could say. And, and also to expand the, and to challenge the divide between persons, things, genders, uh, natural, artificial, etc. And um, especially in, the f in what we can uh, think as a distinction between language and geology because the Anthropocene has much to do with a certain writing of the earth. So uh, this is, I've been occupied with this. Uh, but besides my artistic practice, I have also been researching um, an idea of counter-visualizations of the Anthropocene through film and specifically in the case, in the case of indigenous film productions. So uh, this is a representation of the Nilsson Baniwa. He's a contemporary artist from Brazil. He's from the Baniwa people. And this is a painting of uh, contemporary indigenous filmmakers in Brazil. Uh, and I've been trying to understand as I was living there as well, how can uh, cinema and indigenous cinema be related with performativity and transform uh, codes of visuality? Uh, so, uh, I've, in a way, I feel that I'm still engaged with performing arts, but through film. So this is an image also of, it could be like a, a good illustration of what is to do a film um, in the villages. So this is a, um, a, a process of uh, making a film in the, with the Huni Queen in, the, the, in Acre, so near the Amazonian rainforest. Uh, uh, but in my case, I've been specifically connected with Guarani Caiova productions. Uh, these films are produced in Mato Grosso do Sul, which is in a way opposite to uh, what we can imagine as an Amazonian life. It is a, a, a zone that is totally destroyed by soya plantations, by corn plantations, by cow uh, um, industry. And, and so, uh, in a way, the representation of anthropogenic landscapes is much more present than in the case of Amazonian films. And I was recently working with a film director called uh, Alberto Alvarez in a performance called Fossil, and this is an, an image of a work that I was doing last year. Uh, and we did a film together uh, that had to do with the relationship between the Guarani language and the Portuguese language. Uh, so we were working together. Uh, but, and besides that, I'm also part of an activist group in, the, in the Lisbon. I'm, a, I'm part of the Indigenous Forum of Lisbon. And I was also co-organizing an Amerindian film festival in Lisbon last year. So we organized in the Calus Gulbenkian uh, Foundation one of the first um, encounters of indigenous film productions, uh, which was kind of a, a, an happening because it, for the first time, indigenous artists were coming to Lisbon, they were coming to a big institution, institution of art and talking about their own productions. And uh, by intersecting com contemporary artistic practice with some of the economical, political, aesthetical, and ontological questions related to the Anthropocene, I've been trying to answer the following question. Is the Anthropocene transforming over-represented notions of humanity and nature in the West? And if yes, are these uh, transformations occurring in the plane of language and visuality? And I share with other researchers that maybe we'll discuss uh, later on our talk, Julia, I share with them, uh, especially anthropologists of the so-called ontological turn as Anna Tsing and Eduard Kohn or Eduard Viveros de Castro, that various modes of mobilizing uh, aesthetics, not specifically within the category of uh, institutional art, are creating intersectionality among the Anthropocene debate, and thus they are also politicizing this debate. So my theoretical work has to do, um, has to do with, uh, with uh, in concrete, with a dialogue with the Americanist debate in anthropology around multinaturalism, expanded humanism, or what we could say expanding anthropomorphism, 
perspectivism and animism, a debate that, as you know, was propelled in Europe through the work of Eduardo Viveres de Castro. Mm -hmm. And Eduardo Viveres de Castro is probably uh, responsible uh, not for inventing, but at least for creating a sort of pan-Amazonic ethnographical and theoretical view uh, about extended humanism. So, of course, it is a work of a series of and in, in, in a group of um, multiple works on, on ethnographical work of different Brazilian anthropologists. But he created this kind of common and, and, and um, let's say, shared perspective of uh, extended humanism. And, it, and, and this theory considers that sentient non-human entities and shamanism, uh, and shamanism are co cosmopolitical agents, agents of the Amazonian ontologies. These approaches, uh, among many others, are experimenting with novel ways of engaging with the world around us and considering that immersion in the lives of fungi, on the lives of microorganisms, in the lives of animals, of plants, is opening up new understandings, new relationships, new accountabilities, and establishing emerg emerging fields of multi-species studies and settling, giving notions of species, of bodies, of life. And of course, it is always about anthropology, but it is about anthropology in the measure that anthropology is not anymore about the anthropos, meaning not about the human anymore. So this is the interesting thing about uh, considering what is what, what is my interest in about anthropology right now is that anthropology it has to de-anthropologize itself. So in a way, it's a, it's a performance practice, no? We could say, because it has to take itself, it's, uh, itself out of its own field. And I'm particularly interested in how indigenous film is about language performance, but also about identity performance. If indigenous bodies were also and were so often thematized as objects of nature, meaning that uh, they belong to a sort of uh, unchanging or a historical uh, reality, to the, at least to the Western eye, their agency in cinema as bodies that film, as bodies that represent others, as bodies that represent themselves, can define language and they can also define uh, conventions. So to produce indigenous film is also about language performances. It, it implies to detach from a performance of the object and to create a sort, we could say, of performance of humanity. And this is Fred Moten speaking in his book uh, In the Break from 2003. So this idea that humanity is also performance, is also something that needs to be extended. Um, so images, uh, and it happens, this is an example from, from the north, from uh, Inuit filmmaking, but I could bring a lot of other images. This is just uh, to bring you something very clear about climate change. But in the case of, uh, for instance, of, the, the, of images from Amazonian communities, uh, sometimes the, the, the representations of rainforests or of indigenous activists and spiritual leaders can counteract the dominant visuality that traditionally divides what we can uh, define as a political image, an anthropological image, or an artistic image. And this confusion is, is quite interesting to see because normally indigenous film is studied by anthropologists, so it's not studied by art makers. So, for instance, the performativity of this Amerindian Film Festival was amazing because these films are all on YouTube, but for the first time they were in an art foundation. So there, was, there were lines and lines of people wanting to see these films because somehow it, they discovered that it is art. So it, it was very funny to see all this process happen. So films become performances in the crossroads of pressing ecological discourses, so they appeal us now, right now in 2021, uh, of, of shamanism, that is something also that is calling our attention, of curative processes of the land. And in the case of Guarani Kiowa people, maybe we can speak of this later, I don't know, uh, they are situated more towards the south of Brazil. So uh, most of this dialogue is really in the, uh, embedded in these anthropogenic landscapes, where the perception and the narrative of the space collides with the history of erasure, forced displacement, effacement, contamination, monoculture. So 
every time you see a film that is filmed on these plantations, what you see is actually something that is not seen, something that is not there anymore. So the absence of the forest is connected with the remembrance of the forest that used to exist and used to be thought. So there's many layers here yeah, to discuss. And um, there was a text that last year I shared with the reader of, um, mm -hmm. of, of this encounter because it, this was supposed to happen last year and it didn't, didn't happen. And the, the name of this text was called Landing, so Aterrizar Teria. Uh, and of course it is a dialogue with Bruno Latour's uh, uh, book uh, on this idea of grounding, of landing. But it's also an idea of looking to these films from the perspective of this appar apparently very simple notion of landing bodies, bodies that return to the earth, bodies that touch the earth, that produce the view from a body instead of the view from above, a view that is like floating. Um, and so this landing gives away, gives way not only to a certain aptic knowledge, uh, so it has to do with touching the earth, but it also has to do with returning to a certain point. Mm -hmm. And maybe this has to do with recalling a certain image and, and could be about looking back, but it's not because images are not there anymore. So there's no back and forth. What, what we have is a, colli a collision of, of what happened and what is happening in the future. So it's sort of an ancestral present, something like this. Um, so there's a collision of this. And, 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 and so temp temporalities collide. And this is one of the, the images that I use in this text that I wrote called Landing Bodies, which is also the work of the Nielsen Baniwa, and it's, uh, it, the, the name of the work is Naturaleza Muerta. So with this, this uh, floating I mean, images, these aerial views of the Amazonian rainforest uh, that can provide you uh, visual evidence of destruction and of deforestation, but instead of giving you a map of deforestation, what it produces is an image of something that disappeared from this rainforest, so in the case the jaguar or a body of or an indigenous life. Uh, I tend to, wear, to argue, as uh, Australian feminist author Elizabeth Gross uh, um, also argues, that art is in a way geographical rather than psychological, <laughs> I could say. It involves the earth, it involves the movements of its qualities, so that, so that they may intensify the sensations of living beings with otherwise imperceptible forces. And one of the provocations of this approach is that, what is, what, is that it opens up a concern with the trajectories of human life into the very long durée. So there's this kind of an expansion of temporal registers of the political, of the ethical, of the erotic, of the, of the aesthetic. Uh, so uh, we take in transformations that open up the depths of times and the depths of spaces. So there's a sort of amplification of time and space if we think about this idea of art as geographical. And I'm rather finishing. So if, if, but I think that if we have this idea of the earth as the geographical, um, we need to, and, and we consider a uh, sort of all, we consider the idea of terrestrial life, we must understand that, of course, this sort of cosmological frame cannot be abstract, no form of life lives in the earth. We live in a certain place in the earth. We, we are mm. situated bodies. We are in a certain connection, in a certain village, in a certain city, in a delimited location. So the body is, uh, and now I'm returning to performance art, the body is a medium, the body is a translator, the body generates its own situatedness in this interplay between the generic and the specific. So, of course, that one could say that every attempt to interpret what a body can do and what images are creating or interfering in our gaze means that a correlation between the generic and the specific is established. So it's, it's a bit with this idea that I wanted to open the discussion with you. Uh, so if, if, we, if we consider uh, other ways of considering a, a, a sort of expanded humanity, but also that if we think of bodies not only as human, but other than human, 
and we connect with different uh, with different perceptions of time and space, and we we tend to see not as linear or as specifically located, but in the interplay of this of these two uh, of different times and different spaces. How can we how, how can we have an attitude of care? How can we think about how can we think with an ethical perspective of this about this? Um, I'm trying this to you <laughs> instead of finishing. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much for this provocation. It's um, yeah, it's nonetheless a very quite uh, ambitious one, but it's true. I think like as I mean, I think from your presentation, but also taking into account everything that has been said in the previous talks. I think this idea of trying to speculate together into forms of intervening, of, of hacking these different forms of, 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 of translability, transescability between the body, the different scales, between the body and the territory, between an understanding or corporeality not as a unique and individual with one like clear boundary as the fantasy of modernity wanted to establish, but actually as an expanded one shared between multiple forms of, 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 of stratas of life and, and life presence in, in the world. Um, that also, as you very well uh, noted down, um, imply a form of care that is not only a, a care devoid of, let's say, the, the, the nasty things that we normally do not associate with care, no? but actually care understood in, in its whole complexity without any form of self-indulgement or indulgement in itself, but actually as a, as, a, as a critical political way to understand that entanglement in which we are. And this is something that we already we really discussed before in back in 2020, but also last last week as we were preparing this conversation, is how to think this entanglement in 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 expanded way that allows us to actually touch upon, no, as you were like mentioning with this gesture of landing, of coming back to earth, no, of this haptic actually landing back. And in a form of togetherness, but also in 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 this um, weaving of different that I mean this like hapticality that allows us to enter other forms of of weaving of different temporalities of different presence and of different experiences. There is um, this is of course is very much connected to to the performance that will follow the talk uh, by. Tiago Granato, in which he weaves you know, the different voices of dancers and choreographers, if I'm not mistaken, or, or authors in general, like past, so actually death presences that still accompany him, or that are part of his heritage. We think there's a philosopher of science that I really like, really like and think a lot with her, which is Vincent Desprez, in which she always talks about like what are the heritage that we carry it with. No? which are not always positive her heritage, but are, are actually weights that um, demand our responsibility towards this. No? So Tiago does that with the voices and the, the heritages of, of past uh, choreographers, present dancers, but also future voices of beings, human, non-human, more than human, no? that actually in his choreographic practice, he tries to weave, or, he, or transar, no? which is the, the title of the yes. transa, no? which is like basically transar in, in Castellano, so basically the weaving of all these different like stratas that is basically through the choreographic, but also thinking with, with Pablo, no? through how the choreographic allows us to actually conjugate forms of practices of incorporation, but also of excorporation mm -hmm. at the same time and togetherness, and also through like the the, the kinetic power, no, or the kinetic um, disposition, like how through movement, all these weavings can be can be performed. How can then um, 
all this um, more than be accessed, but really can be actually performed or put in or put into play. So this is just like actually a, like a commentary like coming from 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 this first question. But I was also remembered of like to actually to ground um, this uh, image symposium. Um, two years, no, actually three, four years ago, when we inaugurated the season of La Escuelita, which was called Social Choreographies, in which some of you actually were here already, Manuel Serrade wrote a text in which he, he basically wrote that the history is not lineal. Lineal, it's its naturalized narrative. No? The history is like experience, circular, an spiral, or elliptic. The body is the agent of history, is the historiographic tool for antonomasia, uh, by antonomasia, antonomasia, whatever. Uh, so history is, after all, somatic. It's a choreographic repertoire of different gestures that are written in a, in a de determinate um, order. And I was thinking also in, I mean, in, in provocation to, to Pablo when he said that when he was uh, a kid, he, only, he could only think of history as something that was devoid of, of bodies. Manuel, when he wrote this, uh, he was actually thinking of voguing as a form of radical performance in which, in which class, gender, race are actually put into dance into a performance of history in which history is actually incorporated and read in a, against the grain uh, through, this, through these practices, right? But, and, then, and again, how the gestures, the everyday gestures are this tool of transescability, you know, trans scaling that you were mentioning at the, at the beginning. How can we actually use the body as this tool of exploring the different scales that we are all engaged with, we're all in compromise with, and we're all implicated in? No? I'm thinking of the gestures of the everyday. I think I actually also like the, the, the images that you showed from your research in Brazil are also very telling and very evocative of this. Mm -hmm. And yes, I would like to maybe like from this, from this shared reflection to think actually what could be the strategies the, or the gestures that can we put into place no? to actually engage with these forms of caring, with these forms of enlarge durations and du durationality, no? which actually filmmaking takes, forms of, for example, of silence, no? which actually in, in many practices and especially in many communities and especially in many indigenous communities is like extremely important. Many, the different forms in which these images um, are actually a sort of, of eloquent uh, testimony of fugitive forms of being, on of fugitive uh, expressions of history. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, so you talked about so many things, uh, but now we'll creating a circle with Pablo because it all it also called my attention to this evocation of history as a deprivation of of body or effacement of bodies, and. And of course, I cannot help me. And when you, when you mentioned the, vo the voguing practice, and and I have been also working with some people that are pr voguer practitioners, and and also in the case and, and of uh, in the indigenous film practices, we we are talking of of practices of histories of memories that were extirped out of history that were bodies very present in their histories. <laughs> but that were neglected from history. So in a way, when we don't see this vitality in history, it's because we're not seeing all that there is, in a way, because uh, there are a lot of oral stories of other ways of other gestures that are fugitive, that were not inscribed, that are maybe called 
a historical. Mm -hmm. uh, and Marisol de la Cadena is an anthropologist from uh, South America. She describes an, uh, her work in, in Peru. Uh, and, and, and there's a, also a discussion on the a historical, a historical, a historical condition of indigenous communities in the way that they don't want to inscribe themselves in, in history. And this makes me think of something that uh, because I was visiting my notes and I, I recovered an interview with a, an, an art collective uh, from uh, Acre, from, from this unique, unique queen communities. So uh, these are, they, um, they paint and they create representations of the views of what we call the miracion, miracion, no sé, uh, the, the experiences of, with ayahuasca. So what you see is these big paintings with the representations of conscience uh, alterations, no? And, uh, and there's a, an interview with this collective and they say, uh, we don't want to be part of, the, of Western art. We just want that Western art opens to cosmic forces. So they don't want to be part of this history. And, and this, is a very, is, this is a very radical gesture, you know, that to say that I don't want to be part of this. And, this, and it also makes me think of, uh, when you talk about care, that care is not only about compassion or about me, 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 you know, like being very, uh, very close to someone and very caring about, about something, but it also has to do with creating a radical distance sometimes. And, and when we talk about ontology, when, and we talked about the anthropology as something that is putting in, in question the anthropos, so the human. And, and this was produced by the ontological turn. And the ontological turn was somehow defending the idea of many worlds, that many worlds are composing a world in a way, so that there, there are multiple ontologies. But by saying this, it doesn't mean that all of these different perspectives and ontologies will be composed in a sort of pacified world mm -hmm. uh, that will accept everybody because these worlds are not, they are not, uh, there's no commensurability between these worlds. They are, they, are, they are at war, in fact, they are at war. And some things will be ex excluded and some things will be neglected, as it happened already. But so when we think about caring and to put attention on things that were not there, as a, as, as a tree, for instance, we have to think that there's, a, there's an, an old memory of neglection and of exclusion of these trees, of the names of these trees, of the lives of these bodies. So it, it's not enough to connect with them. It is part to connect and to have an aptic perception and to hug a tree is already something. But in a way, there is also radical war at stake. Trees are falling. Uh, like water is being contaminated, like drills are being made to take oil out, to take lithium. So there's a war, there's an ontological war. And, and I think this is very important, that's why I brought the political in the beginning, because when we think about encompassing like the ontological scope, you know, and to connect with different layers of time and different layers of space, we we need also to be very conscious that, that this war is being made mm -hmm. and that it, we are called to it. Maybe this is a bit hard to say, but I think it is important. And I, I thought about two, two, two examples uh, that I think are important maybe to consider this idea of scale. One is Astrid Neimanis, uh, someone that is working a lot with water, so maybe a connection with the Medusas. <laughs> Um, and there's an example in a text, and I think the text is called The Bodies of Water, or something like this, mm -hmm. where she gives you like an exercise, which is to drink a, a glass of water. And, and then there's like three paragraphs, and she's saying like, while you're drinking this water, pay attention to, and there's like a list of things, so where this water comes from, the reservoirs of this water, all the microbacteria that are there, all the, the chemicals that were put there to put this to create this water that you, maybe it's like good to drink, 
uh, all the, 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 the ramifications and the pipelines that take you to where the water is. And all the estrogens, all the hormones that are in this water because every cycle of water in our pee, we are recycling hormones that are in plastic, like estrogen that is very present in our pee. So it goes back to water. And when you drink, you're drinking estrogen. So all the, of this cycle, and it's, when, you, when you see this example, it's an example of an e extreme violence. It's not at all caring. It's not like, oh, I'm drinking a, what, a, a, a glass of water. No, I'm drinking like an history of a lot of inequalities and, 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 and an history of violence. And another example is, has more to do with the earth is Achille Membis in his last book called Brutalism, mm -hmm. where he's speaking about drilling and, and f fracturating and f an idea of fissuration, no sé, como de extracción de la tierra. Entonces, uh, <laughs> uh, so he's talking about like, this energy of suction, of extraction, and how all of these energies are like brutalizing and in a, in a brutal way, in a brutal way, materializing in our bodies. Mm -hmm. So also that there is an, a combustion of energy, an extraction of energy that it, that then then returns to our bodies in the form of a Coca-Cola can, for instance, which is this aluminium can. And I think these examples are very interesting to think about how in a way there's a new materialism in our thinking, at least in our Western thinking, there are t our te theoretical perspectives, we are producing new materialisms. Uh, but these materialisms have to do with a lot of virtual scales because these scales are enormous. Like if you think about the scale of lithium, about the scale of oil, it's millions and millions of years of something that was taken out, it was alive, it became something that is not alive anymore, and then it becomes a, a can of Coca-Cola, and then you drink. And by having this perception of time, it's immense. But it's not only discursive, it is material, because you're drinking the, the, the Coke. So, uh, yeah, it's... It is a noun. Uh, it has to do with ghosts in a way. Yeah, it has to do with being haunted by this history of inequality, of violence, of extraction, and really putting it aptically in in our bodies. And I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think like there was like the question of spectrality has also been very present. Um, in the different in the different talks this morning, I mean this afternoon, sorry, and I think that's also given the intimate um, the intimate relationship between images that are troubling that have not been resolved. That is something that bear the traces and the residues of current and historical genealogies of violence, of of, of inequalities, of of deep injustice that are still troubling or gestures or memories from very latent to even more conscious states. No? Um, Isabel was referring to, to, to Le Pecky's uh, The Body as an Archive and actually also Foucault's idea of the, you know, the utopic body and, the, and, the, and the also the, well, where he starts with the body in our, as an archive. And not long ago, I was um, actually hosting a, a conversation with Ruth, Gil Ruth Wilson Gilmore, in which she remembered the, a quote from, from, from this concept of the body as an archive from Stuart Hall. Basically, Stuart Hall, what he put to the forth is that the body is an archive of all these different processes, lines of subjectivization, experiences, histories that we are um, coming from and accumulating, but we don't have an index of it yet. We still don't have an index which allows us to maybe navigate it, maybe access it, even recognize it very clearly and very consciously. And that, in a way, it's, um, it's actually like, an, like the drive that animates most of our, of, of our work now to try to sometimes excavate, to trace uh, all those different, different layers. 
But there's also the moment of the acclaim for opacity that comes from there, that really also connected to what you said of the filmmakers, the indigenous filmmakers that claim for non-participating in a linear uh, history or in a canonized Western art history. No? So the problem with opacity or opaque forms of writing history or opaque forms of, of writing the body, the, let's say the, the claim for non-legible uh, aesthetic practices or actually also not only aesthetic but even more like choreographic and, and actually also writing practices. No? Is this tension between the transparency and the opacity, the legibility and the illegibility in which there's a, again to cite again our dear Pablo Marte, there's a flattering of, the, of, of meaning, no? there's a, actually a fugitive again a presence of, of meaning or an image that, that might appear. So, um, and I'm thinking this also again when with um, how you, for example, you take, you take Astrida's um, example no? of how through like a quotidian gesture of like just drinking a bottle of water, there's that capacity to go from, from the different like stratas that resonate or vibrate in one way or another in our bodies, in our somatic archives, in our shared experiences, in our collective archives of history, but also in our daily gestures to our more conscious or even discursive um, actions. Um, having said that, maybe I wanted to actually like uh, steer the conversation into time and different temporalities that have been, that are actually also in the making in all these crossings. Isabel also mentioned like the, the issues of nonlinear history, but also of, of, of I think also in Pablo uh, talk, the question of dur durationality uh, was very important. So I'm actually maybe interpreting you here not only as a scholar and as a theorist and a writer, but also as a performer. No? Because like when you mentioned that you're um, researching, for example, the time of catastrophes, linked to the Anthropocene, I was reminded of Elizabeth Freeman, who's a queer historian and, and theorist, who posits that, um, well, that, that time is binding and that actually sexual dissonance is actually entangled with form of, temp uh, of breaking the temporalities and forms of queer rewriting of history has to do with forms of asynchrony, with syncope, et cetera, et cetera. But there's also, uh, in the book of Time Minds, there's also a notion of the chronic, in which she contraposes the idea of, of, of the, well, the temporal logistics of events or crises and catastrophes as being event-geared towards thinking more of the chronic as something that happens afterwards. No? And she thinks of the AIDS, AIDS crisis, she thinks of, of different, actually, seismic moments in which all these different um, tectonic plates, let's say, of politics, shared and lived experience, and worlding are interconnected or actually break to create uh, other gaps. So when she thinks of the chronic, she doesn't think, she tries to rescue it from the medical terminology of being something, um, you know, a chronic pain, something that is a malaise that never goes away, but she actually also connected connects it to the subcultural use of the chronic as a, as a, as a brand of marijuana that is actually, like, and this connected me to, the, to what you were saying about, the, about ayahuasca and how the chronic also allows you to dilate the experience of the presence, to have much more enlarged um, um, experience of that present in which issues of struggle, but also of joy are not disconnected from each other. No? So also, would the chronic be something, for example, that you as a performer, but also as a researcher, can connect to your, to your interests? Yeah, I, th I think uh, since, the, since we, we had this talk like last week, that um, 
And also with Isabel, I stay with this, um, with something that is that is very, in a way, very touching for, for me, which is this idea of back and forth, and and the back of the body and the front of the body, and how in. Of course, we have established that the front of the body has to do with the horizon, so a certain idea of futurability, and then the back of the body and the back of the head is something that is in the past, so something that is also um, condemned to a certain oblivion that you don't see. And, and I've been interested about how can we also change these ideas, or at least uh, to to intercept a bit this back and forth. And I was reading a book um, with a friend uh, um, uh, by Silvia Kusikanki, Silvia Rivera Kusikanki, she's an indigenous scholar, and, and, and she talks a, a lot about this idea of thinking with the kidneys. So to have a pens, uh, pensar con los riñones, no? So it's good of having the front of the head as some a place that okay has more light and a place where you have more clarity, but then you also have this. It has to do. We, we would call it thinking with the arts or more mm -hmm. with them an emotional, but it's truly uh, much more connected with an idea that by walking uh, forward, you are in fact. Uh, going to your uh, to your kidneys, you are going to your past. So you walk towards your past. You don't walk towards the future. And 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 this idea with, that is, I think, very important also for I, we cannot say for indigenous communities because they they are not abstractions. They are indigenous lives and have very concrete experiences. But the way they are, uh, mo some of the communities are dealing with this official um, uh, uh, criteria for understanding what is history, what is um, geography, what is memory, etc., obliges them to have many temporalities at the same time. And this in my I, and I think in my work and especially as a writer, I've been uh, I've been very interested about this. I was I'm right now in the middle of writing a sort of a sci-fi um, project um, about queer sexual manuals, etc., called Spiel Lovers, and 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 so these lovers that they they produce a lot of water all the time, and they can solve a lot of ecological problems because they produce water by loving each other. Um, by doing this, they open up. Um, uh, portals of time, so um, they they open up different time frames at different layers, mm -hmm. and they recall something that they that they forgot, which was a tail, mm -hmm. and and they don't know if this tail was in the back or in the front, so maybe it was a dick. We don't know, but th there's so there's uh, there there is uh, a call also for. Um, for a certain sabotage of, of this idea of linear time, at least. And I, th I, I think it's, it's qu it, it is quite important, yes, for in, indeed. Um, but it's not only, it is not only open up different layers of time, it's also open up to failure, as would say Jack Halberstam, the queer art of failure. So to understand that failure, erasure, um, neglection, they are part of our history as queers, for instance, mm -hmm. and, and and so in, in these ways, uh, the joy is within the struggle. Mm -hmm. So um, it's understanding all of this, uh, and then there's there is also, and this is the specificity of of, of my work and my last three works at least that have to do with this relationship between geology and language. And yes, I was very in interested because this discussion on the Anthropocene has to do with um, the idea that uh, there's an inscription of humanity in geological strata. Mm -hmm. So you would uh, have scientific evidence that uh, hum the humanity, the species, has produced uh, an inscription that that then can be validated as a new epoch, a new geological era called the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. And this discussion in terms of, of science is very interesting because it has to do with inscribing a certain language. Yeah. 
but in a, in a depth of time that is very like this was we the long durée history. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started to be to to get to get interested also in this and my and this work that I w that I showed with uh, that was writing in the earth uh, has to do with this um, representation of the fossil as uh, something that is at, at the same time a record of history. So we use it as a specimen or a record of history. So where there's an, a mineral fossil that recalls us a certain history or a human fossil, but also fossil as energy. So mm -hmm. as oil, as also in an history, but an history of extractivism and not told as history, told as something else. Uh, so, so yes, I think this is, um, we, uh, I, I talked about a sort of new materialism and maybe this is not a good, uh, yeah. a, a good idea to describe what is happening right now with the ontological turn or the multi-species theory, but I feel that we are, we are getting close to, uh, to, we know that we need to trigger some connectors that were disactivated and, and, and so we're, it's much more about fluxes and, and containers, the discovering like bodies of waters that a possibility of containment, a body of flesh, a possibility of containment, and then fluxes of minerals, fluxes of water, fluxes of energy. Mm -hmm. So I, I, this for me is something that is present in a lot of these authors that we've been discussing and in my own practice in a way. Mm, yes. Have we look? Yeah. Podemos, podemos abrir la, la conversación a preguntas si os apetece, si queréis, en el idioma también que preferáis. Pero si no, y, o sea, ambas dos podemos contestar también, yo creo que es las preguntas las podemos contestar. Yo, yo puedo contestar en castellano. Y si no, podemos ir saltando y, y traduciendo también entre las diferentes como ideas. Um, there's also... There's two other things that actually like jump in between the scales and thinking also of like going back to, to for example, more the molecular scale to in which, as you said, no, like in our in, in the whole like even physiological compositions of our bodies, we can find the traces of wider scales of cosmological um, structuring. How like traces of fossil fuels or of the different hormones are still flowing into a into a sort of joyful but highly contaminated uh, assemblage of, of our bodies, and and I was thinking also thinking with you after uh, after our conversation, although in silence, I was thinking also how can we imagine for for example those forms of of molecular choreographing and I was actually uh, remembering also of in in this idea of mothering otherwise or motherhood but written like M otherhood so um, basically critical and, and non-linear forms of or, or non-biological actually forms of of caring of mothering which are also no exe no, not exempted of conflict and I remember like the discussion of the mirror neurons, no? that were mirror neurons, a neuronas espejo. Basically, when you're caring for a very, and when that type of care is like very physical, you develop a form of neuro, neuron image in which like the both subjects entangled in the, caref in the caring uh, relationship actually start learning from each other or modifying each other. No? And so thinking also how this could, um, again, no? create a form of choreography of nonlinear heritage, of nonlinear uh, descendants or uh, patrilineal, let's say, forms of, of history. No? Can, how can that be, be put into place? Of course, this takes forms of duration, lines of time, which are even sometimes actually much wider than we can actually, what, what we can actually consciously engage with. But nevertheless, there are processes such as, for example, fermentation, which is, I know it's something also 
one of our shared interests that in which you engage that deal with this form of actually like co-evolution, symbiogenetic no? uh, um, transformation. If we think that from, from, from taking as an example a SCOBY such as, I don't know, kombucha or kefir, that maybe emerge, actually also thinking of conditions of emergence, emerge out of a, of a cup of tea somewhere in Korea mm -hmm. uh, spontaneously and that has been kept to these days through actually like the, um, the, the reproduction of, with other communities, both humans and humans, no? living to, to these days. And actually, Lynn Margulis has a, has a text in which she, uh, she, she explores fermentation linked to sex and linked to cannibalism. Mm -hmm. Because in, in trying to, um, to turn down the, like, the neo-Darwinist form of understanding history and evolution and through survival of the fittest, she claims that actually if we looked, look as, uh, to micro biology, we actually find forms of cooperation and actually also of violence, so of, of eating one, one another mm -hmm. and even each other, hence the cannibalism, but that were actually at the origin and at the basis of, of, of life in the planet, no? mm -hmm. which like, goes from the cellular but also to the gestures of caring, to the incorporation, to the, and the whole cycle that, mm -hmm. that comes from there. Yes, no, this is, this is a, another world that we I know, could I know. open. We're touching, we're touching like huge <laughs> worlds, but anyway. But I think, yeah, I think it is, um, maybe I could recall this because it's very recent experience. Um, before coming here, I was one month in residency with a group of um, uh, 25 other artists. And, and the idea was, um, so we, had, we were curating a public program in the theater. And um, in a way, well, also with the pandemics, of, but it, it didn't come from the pandem pandemics, but, uh, but it came also with certain struggling that, that we had at the, at the moment and at the present. So we, we, we decided to, to produce a public program that would be a sort of a living with uh, the theater. So we brought uh, SCOBIES, which is this, um, uh, let's say, a uh, society of... Uh, Symbiotic cultures of uh, bacteria, bacteria and yeast. And, yeast. and uh, we were fermenting um, during these uh, three weeks of residency. We also had a flower installation, and the idea is that this flower would uh, de-seed with us during these three weeks. And what we would do as public presentation would be, we'd call it general assemblies. So we had general assemblies every weekend. And, and some of them were about fermentation and were about Lynn Margulis and were about um, food sovereignty and, and, and all of that. Um, but I, I think, but I wanted to bring this because uh, I understood as an artist that uh, there is a certain limit uh, to uh, to my own patience as a performance artist <laughs> to, uh, to, uh, to well, understand as theater and with, with what we understand as performance and uh, as a show. Because a show has a certain idea of scale and a certain idea of, um, of situation that it's, it's not possible to, to dialogue with all of this scalabilities that we are mentioning here. Uh, so I was, I was wondering with this collective of, of, of artists, how could we somehow open up a bit and trigger other discussions with the theater curators and, 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 and with the audience, how could we open up to, to other scales? And one of our uh, collective tasks was to bring the sunlight to inside of the black box. So we did this mirror effect since the entrance of the theater, Till the, till the black box with different mirrors and we brought sunlight inside of the theater. Another one was to eat bread and the other was to <laughs> eat our own food. So th th things that somehow we, we, we there's, there's a process of disactivating uh, our attention, our, our culture of attentiveness and of caring mm -hmm. uh, that is so profound, so profound 
that um, we, we, we really need to do like a very pedagogical and didactical, didactical work with, with like, like drinking kombucha and being with a kombucha, like to really do what, how Donna, Donna Haraway says, like thinking with the kombucha. Because we, we need kombucha near us, we need to drink it and we need to install it in our bodies in order to, to understand that we are all bacteria, we are nothing more than this, where there's no... Okay, there are containments, there's a self, there, there is some containers, but everything else is flux. And it's a chain of, 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 of signs and of production of languages, produ production of sem uh, semiosis. Uh, so, I, I don't know, I think um, it, 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 it is a very, uh, it's a blurring and complex issue. How, to, how can we open up these layers, mm -hmm. no? Um, and I remember when I worked with Pedro Neves Marques, there's an ex exhibition of Pedro, Yep. in this well, you center, he worked with yeah. us in a, in a show that was a show, it was really like a one hour show, etc. and he did the videos, etc. But one of the things he wanted to propose, and the, the show co was called the uh, Anthropocenes. So there were many scenes of the Anthropos, like the history of art, we were doing ballet, and uh, all of these representations of nature, uh, through the art, the dance history, etc. And one of the things I wanted to bring to the, to the stage was E. coli, mm -hmm. so a bacteria that produces <laughs> diarrhea. <laughs> and he wanted to put this on stage. And I said, but no one will know, they will, people will get sick and that's it. <laughs> and there was an old discussion on this. How can you, how can you bring a problem um, and, and really uh, disactivate also your, your tendency to represent the problem? and to create like a naturaleza muerta the, of this problem, you know, to really de depict it as a, as a, as a still life instead mm -hmm. of activating as a problem, as a somatic experience. Of course, no one wanted that the audience got a coli, but, uh, <laughs> but th this discussion was quite interesting because in the end, all of his work that is mainly audiovisual and experimental film works so very well on film, but on stage, it's not visible, so we don't know what to do with it. So we, and there I understood that we really have an ocular uh, centrism that is so powerful that even on our best tries, <laughs> it's difficult. <laughs> Hola. Um, bueno, vamos a abrir un poquito también eh, por si, bueno, estaría bien saber un poco si estáis ahí. <laughs> Eh, bueno, a mí, eh, muchas gracias a las dos. Creo que, bueno, uf, te han dicho muchas cosas. A mí me parece muy interesante este, este último punto, ¿no? De como esa, ese conflicto, ¿no? De qué significa pensar con, estar con, disponerse, disponer el cuerpo a. Me hacía pensar, me apetecía traerlo, llevarlo un poquito más, forzarlo un poco hacia la zona en la que estamos, ¿no? En relación con el teatro como espacio, como lugar de posibilidad y la coreografía como práctica. ¿no? Siempre pienso en la coreografía no como, como disciplina, sino como ese lugar o ese terreno de posibles prácticas físicas, sí. posibles prácticas corporales, también de probar ¿no? un lugar de ensayo. Y creo que en ese sentido eh, estabais ahora también hablando de la microbiología ¿no? y pensaba este pensamiento por analogía, ¿no? en la convivencia entre ese pensamiento en imágenes o pensamiento a través de metáforas o pensamiento a través de representaciones puede convivir con ese otro eh, pensar con qué significaría, ¿no? Disponer, disponerse a ser atravesada o a ser, eh, sí, atravesada celularmente por todas esas simbiosis ¿no? que ya estamos eh, viviendo y que ya vivimos, que constantemente vivimos, ¿no? que no, no hace falta tomarse la pastilla para que ya está estamos ahí, pero, pero que de alguna forma eh, pensaba en Tiago, precisamente en Tiago Granato, que mañana, mañana él va a compartir su conferencia en la que va a presentar lo que es el proyecto que engloba la performance que vamos a ver ahora, pero sí que me apetecía hacer un apunte porque me ha parecido muy sugerente todo este terreno de la, de la microbiología, 
eh, porque Tiago, por un lado, en este proyecto de coreoversaciones, eh, digamos que parte de una idea eh, que implicaría disponer su cuerpo, disponer sus facultades como, ¿no? como bailarín, performer, coreógrafo, es decir, sus habilidades, eh, disponerlas a conversaciones imaginarias con otros, algunos no están, otros sí y otros eh, seres que estarán por venir, pero digamos eh, conversaciones imaginarias en las que él sería, pondría su cuerpo a disposición para para esas coreografías que hacen otros, ¿no? Este doble trayecto, ¿no? Esta, que él lo relaciona con la idea de, de difracción, de Karen Barard y de intracción, eh, pero que de alguna forma, eh, bueno, esa idea de disposición a mí me lleva como a un gesto, a un gesto así, ¿no? Como a un gesto de tumbarse en el suelo, ¿no? De landing, ¿no? De como te tumbas en el suelo y es la espalda la que siente la hierba, ¿no? Es la espalda la que, la que de alguna forma está, está, está en contacto. Pero pensaba también en las manos, ¿no? que han aparecido también mucho. Eh, en mi conferencia están muy presentes, creo que también estarán muy presentes aquí Ana Folguera, por ejemplo, ¿no? que también has trabajado, que mañana nos presentará su ponencia y también las manos como esa especie de eh, lugar de conexión. Y que en el caso de, de, de Tiago, ¿no? a través del trabajo físico-anatómico de exploración de este tejido que es la fascia, ¿no? la fascia eh, como esta membrana que él nos explicará mejor mañana, pero como esta membrana que por un lado recubre cada uno de los órganos del cuerpo, pero también re recubre toda la estru estructura de los órganos a la vez ¿no? y que se encuentra como por debajo de la piel, que es un tejido conector, que a la vez, eh, aunque en medicina no se dice, pero en algunas... Um, en algunos estudios sí se habla de la fascia como eh, aquello que nos permite entender más allá de las palabras, ¿no? O sea, aquello que nos permite saber si yo te pregunto qué tal estás y tú me dices que bien, yo puedo saber que no estás bien, ¿no? O sea, como, cómo saber lo que hay detrás de lo que se representa o de lo que se pretende comunicar, ¿no? Una suerte de, de membrana de escucha. Entonces, me parece muy interesante cómo este tipo de prácticas ¿no? eh, coreográficas o de prácticas que yo llamo experimentales en un sentido real de experimentación, no, no de categoría artística, sino de, de experimentar, de, de, de experienciar, eh, cómo eh, pueden abrir posibilidades eh, para, para pensar esos modos de relación, esas formas posibles de convivencia, esas, en, esas formas posibles de distancia también, ¿no? Entonces pensaba tanto en el teatro como, como espacio, eh, digamos, de, de posibilidad, en dos, en dos sentidos, ¿no? O sea, tú hablabas del el teatro como, como espacio de fermentación, como un, ¿no? convertirse el teatro en un espacio de fermentación. Pero también, volviendo también al citado Walter Benjamin, eh, cuando él habla de que la memoria no es un instrumento para conocer el pasado, sino su teatro, ¿no? que en algunas eh, traducciones se dice eh, la memoria no es un instrumento para conocer el pasado, sino su medio, y en otras se dice su teatro. ¿no? Entonces, me parece como muy interesante esta tensión entre medio y teatro, cuando él habla de teatro, del teatro del pasado. ¿no? Es decir, que, eh, y además este es en un, en, un, en un textito que se llama Excavar y recordar, en el que precisamente tú, Julia, has sacado la, la imagen de excavar, ¿no? o sea, como de... Eh, de qué manera esa memoria es una excavación física que requiere de unas eh, condiciones espaciales, una especie de escenificación de la, de la situación. O sea, como es, esa, ese teatro, esa escenificación, no como, como lugar de, de ficción, sino como, como posibilidad de activación, ¿no? de un potencial. Entonces, bueno, pensaba en todas estas cosas en relación con, con el teatro y con la coreografía, quizás... Eh, me gustaría traer la conversación a eso, ¿no? a de qué manera, eh, bueno, ya lo, lo hemos traído también a través de, la, de, de, de estas prácticas, pero en tu caso, Rita, eh, pues es muy, yo pienso que una de las eh, potencias de tu hacer es precisamente esa conjugación o combinación entre la posibilidad de un pensamiento político in que interviene en la realidad, ¿no? Que, eh, realmente incide en una realidad muy tangible y muy concreta y muy específica de situaciones sociales, políticas, históricas de, 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 de las personas pero, y también de los medios ¿no? del planeta, pero también eh, como 
en ese caso yo te preguntaría, ¿qué es a ti lo que esas prácticas artísticas, coreográficas, teatrales, experimentales, qué es lo que te devuelven? ¿no? O sea, ¿Qué es lo que te devuelven a toda esta eh, preocupación y ocupación que tienes con respecto a, ¿no? al planeta, a la, sí, al sí. cambio climático, al antropoceno? Yo, yo pensaba cuando hablabas que, que de primero, con, sobre todo con la, con la pandemia, que he pensado como las artes performativas son como profiláticas, ¿no? Hay como una profilaxia de la proximidad que está ahí y que cuando fue desactivada no se podría hacer nada. Yo pensé, no, pero sin esto, como, es como, es la pedagogía de la, la proximidad, es lo más importante, es, 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 es tan importante que... Que, que, se, que hay un encuentro, ¿no? entonces que, que ese encuentro no se puede perder. Eh, yo muchas veces me fui afuera del campo de la danza, muchas, muchas veces. Eh, trabajo muchas, mucho más veces con gente de las artes visuales o con, de la poesía o del pensamiento, del pensamiento, pero hay como siempre algo que me llama y que, que me vuelve a es siempre más interesante trabajar o hay siempre, siempre necesito trabajar con una, al menos una persona o dos que tienen un, como un labor o una práctica coreográfica. Y yo creo que tiene que ver con eso que hablabas, que dabas el ej ejemplo de la fascia, como hay como una, una experiencia somática que, que tiene que ver con excavación también, porque no está hecha, está muy desactivada. Y necesita como un trabajo muy importante, pero cuando lo haces puedes, uh, puedes pensar muy mejor y puedes, y, puedes, y puedes hacer las cosas muy mejor. Eso es para mí muy importante. Como se, toda la discusión que tenemos, ya, y yo hago como trabajo como académica, y voy a hacer conferencias, ese tipo de cosas, y yo veo que no hay cuerpo, y como no hay cuerpo, nada pasa, no, no, no pasa nada. El conocimiento se queda como, estoy exagerando, claro, pero se queda muy como cerrado eh, en una, um, sí, una imagen, una representación de un problema que está bien porque es, es importante también tener las imágenes y saber hablar de ellas, ahora estoy hablando argentino, uh, pero, pero al mismo tiempo uh, yo si no hay como una posibilidad, yo, yo no creo que tiene solo que ver con afección, tiene que ver realmente con expansión de un conocimiento, como el, el conocimiento como, como care, como, como algo que, ¿cómo se dice? Care? Cuidado. Cuidado, el pensamiento como, cuido, como cuidado. Y que ahí el, 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 la, la educación somática, la práctica somática, la experimentación es muy importante, pero para mí no está muy... Uh, no, es, no es diferente de la práctica de la escritura, porque yo siento que para escribir necesito un cuerpo. Eh, y, y también no está alejada de la práctica, de prácticas más de exper experienciales, como experimentar ayahuasca o algo así, que, que, me, que, que han creado posibilidades de expansión y de entendimiento que... que, que Sí, de tomar una conciencia que no hay una división entre lo que se piensa y lo que, y lo que se hace, en lo que, se, en lo, en lo que podemos hacer, pensar como una imagen o podemos pensar como un cuerpo, es, como, es la misma cosa. Pero como que tenemos una, una hipervalorización del, del espacio ocular, entonces el espacio áptico se queda como un espacio volvido un poco místico, ¿no? como espiritual, que está ahí, que está muy bien, porque yo soy una persona muy espiritual, pero yo quería decir con eso es que en la, en la nomenclatura o la idea uh, occidental o espiritual o místico es, que es, es, es algo que está afuera, no que está dentro. Entonces lo que está dentro, tenemos que entender que hay como paradojos muy brutales en el occidente, como porque intentamos pensar una continuidad entre cuerpos. Nosotros tenemos cuerpos, hay continuidad, tienes pies, yo tengo pies, tienes manos, un animal tiene una cola, tiene eso, una planta, y hay una continuidad 
eh, física, material, entre los, las diferentes vidas, pero al nivel del pensamiento y del conocimiento, no. Yo soy, uh, no sé, una persona de Portugal, bla, 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 tengo esa clase, cultura, etc. No soy la misma persona que una persona negra que viene de una, del sur, etc. Y también no soy un árbol, no soy un árbol, no soy. Y no hay una continuidad entre, entre el árbol y el humano. Entonces, paradojos crean después también paradojos muy brutales entre lo áptico y lo visual, yo creo. Porque hay como hay un espacio que sería continuo, yo creo que, es, que, que sería importante que sea continuo, pero no es. Entonces, cuando vas al teatro, estás con, con, con la, la educación es para, es para mirar de una manera y no para estar atento al áptico. Pero todo eso está pasando, tenemos neuronas de espejo, tenemos, todo lo áptico está pasando, toda la fase está respondiendo, pero necesita mucho trabajo. Entonces yo diría que mi interés está ahí como amplificar y, y dar un espacio que, que es lo espacio que, que, que está ahí pero está desactivado y que necesita se hacer. Me avisan de que ya mm, es tiempo de... Sí, la verdad Ahora es que... que como empecé a hablar... Eso, ya, sí, no, la verdad es que... Yo hablo muy bien, ¿no? <risa> no, y es verdad, y además también hemos empezado como desde unos marcos mucho más grandes y ahora estábamos sí, sí. aterrizando y pues sí, sí. otra vez, ¿no? Es una, o sea, es una petición por otros tiempos y, sí. y por seguir pensando, pero bueno, las jornadas también... Vamos a confiar, en que, vamos a confiar en que todo eso se vaya dando... Sí. Se vaya dando, pero bueno, sí, hablas muy bien castellano, la verdad. Eh, eh, muchas gracias a las dos. Yo creo que la persona más que vamos a ir directamente arriba eh, ya, sí, ya nos va a ayudar también a ir hilando las cosas. Muchas gracias, Julia y Rita. Gracias.